Weaving through Japan's Southern Alps lies the Oi River. To an outsider, it looks ordinary. But in reality, this river is the last remaining hurdle between the world and its first 500 km an hour commercial maglev, Japan's Chuo Shinkansen. This is why maglev keeps failing, and how Japan is trying to fix it. While maglev can seem like a futuristic fever dream, still years away in a distant technological realm, it is in fact mid-20th century tech. Germany's Transrapid and Japan's JR Maglev both emerged in the 1960s and 70s, spent decades proving the physics on test tracks, and even reached service. Shanghai's airport link opened in 2004, with a few low to medium speed urban lines sprinkled around Asia. The science was never the problem. The real issue was economics and integration. At low speeds, a maglev behaves like any normal train, because it still rolls on small rubber tyres. The difference is propulsion. Instead of spinning axles, a linear motor in the guideway creates a travelling magnetic wave that pulls the train forward. As the speed climbs to about 150 km an hour, changing magnetic fields between the train and track generate lift and centering forces. The wheels retract and the vehicle levitates, so friction drops to mostly air resistance and it can push forward towards 500 km an hour. Shanghai's line uses EMS, active electromagnets that pull the vehicle up to the rail, while Japan uses EDS, where superconducting coils induce lift once the train is moving, giving very stable levitation at high speed and suiting long tunnel runs. So why does maglev keep failing, if the science is so foolproof? Well, it's because the world around the science is hard. Maglev is an island, it can't share tracks, depots or signals with existing rail, so you can't just upgrade existing corridors with the new technology. Instead, everything had to be built from scratch. Bespoke guideway, custom switches, new power and control, new yards and new fleets. That's a capital shock. While there are certainly advantages, against a best-in-class high-speed rail network running 350 km an hour, Maglev's extra 150 km usually saves minutes, not hours, on typical city pairs. Near 500 km an hour, air drag and aero noise spike, tunnel pressure management gets expensive, and lifetime support is locked to a handful of vendors. Politically, it's easier to spend on improvements that benefit more riders sooner than to fund a separate incompatible network. Across the entire globe, only six commercial maglev lines exist, and five of them cover trivial distances. But that does leave one reasonably successful example, the Shanghai maglev. The Shanghai Maglev sprints 30 kilometers from Pudong Airport to Longyang Road in 7 to 8 minutes, peaking around 430 kilometers an hour. It's spectacular, yet isolated. Riders still transfer to the metro to reach the city's core, so the line functions more like a premium airport shuttle than a backbone. Because it can't hop onto existing rails, every kilometer of expansion would mean duplicating guideway, depots, power and control systems. While it proves the physics, it also exposes the island problem. Japan's use case is different. The country doesn't just want faster. It needs a second spine to back up the coastal Tokaido corridor that carries the economy. The Chuo Shinkansen's mountain route is tunnel heavy by design, which plays to maglev strengths. No level crossings, controlled environment, and minimal surface impact where land is scarce. If you're going to build an all-new incompatible system anywhere, this is where it actually solves a problem the old line can't. Redundancy and resilience. But there is one issue with this route, and it's the thing that pushed opening into the 2030s, with some forecasts sliding as far as 2037. The Oi River. To stitch Tokyo and Nagoya together, the line has to punch a 9km tunnel under Shizuoka's Oi Basin. On paper, Shizuoka gets the risk, but not the reward. The maglev doesn't stop there, it just passes beneath. The fear was hydrology, that construction could draw down base flow, spike turbidity, shift temperature, and stress farms, towns, and habitats downstream. 
So in June 2020, largely led by one politician named Haita Kawakatsu, the prefecture set out its simple position. Prove you can dig without the river noticing. For years, that demand turned into a standstill. Meetings dragged, surveys stalled, and the 9km gap became the symbol of a national project going nowhere. Not because all the magnets didn't work, but because the rules of the river weren't agreed. However, in 2024, after a separate controversy, Governor Haita Kawakatsu, the face of the opposition, resigned from office. With new leadership, the tone shifted from headlines to homework. The dispute moved off the podium and into spreadsheets. Hydrologists, engineers, and regulators sat down to specify exactly how you dig without the river noticing. And in 2025, they landed the big pieces. Full return water management during construction, and live pre-agreed thresholds on flow, turbidity, and temperature. A web of gauges now feed the dashboard. If readings drift beyond limits, crews will stop work immediately until a solution is found. Most of the original issues have since been solved, and the ones remaining as of writing are practical and fixable. Perhaps the most difficult of these is spoil logistics. Most excavated rock is perfectly routine, but a small portion, called countermeasure soils, needs strict handling. Separate it at the face, test it and label it, store it in lined covered bays, move it by rail on fixed routes, and place it only at permitted sites with a capped end use. At that point, the remaining item is construction permission. Shizuoka's final permits fold everything into law. Water return, live monitoring, and the last biodiversity windows. And spell out the stop-start rules tied to the gauges. Once those documents are signed, JR Central can open headings, mobilize haul routes, and move from paperwork to rock. Clearing these last few hurdles unlocks far more than speed. Tokyo to Nagoya falls to 40 minutes, and when a phase 2 reaches Osaka, the Tokyo to Osaka route comes in at just 70 minutes, centre to centre. More importantly, Japan gains a second spine, a deep tunnel heavy route that keeps moving during storms, heat waves, and earthquake inspections that slow the coastal line. The classic Takedo Shinkansen can hand off long haul expresses, freeing more slots for intermediate cities. For passengers, that means better frequency and resilience. For the economy, it removes a single point of failure in the country's busiest corridor. For the world, it's the first proof that maglev can work beyond an airport shuttle, as an integrated, high-demand trunk line. Put simply, if Japan flips the last lights, then this becomes the fastest practical way to travel between its biggest cities, faster than flying, centre to centre. No taxis to distant airports, no queues, no weather holes, just a 40 minute Tokyo to Nagoya hop. It would mark the first true 500 km an hour trunk line anywhere in the world, turning maglev from a demo into a backbone and opening a new era where intercity trips feel like short commutes. Quiet, punctual, stormproof, and frequent enough that journeys can be planned with precision and efficiency. There are certainly still ways this can slip. Countermeasure soils could prove more expensive than expected, forcing bigger line storage and more rail movements. Miss a biodiversity window and headings could be delayed by months. Long tunnels bring pressure wave, ventilation and evacuation systems that must be commissioned flawlessly, or reworked at the cost of time. At 500 km an hour, energy and area noise management matter more than the headline speed, and any cost creep on spoil handling or mitigation can spook the politics just when permits are within reach. Most of all, public trust now hinges on transparent monitoring. If the OIS gauges show drift and work doesn't pause exactly as promised, the river will become a roadblock again. Maglev cleared the physics bar half a century ago. Where it kept failing was the world around it, operations that don't interoperate and economics that rarely pencil out. Japan's case is the outlier because the goal isn't just headline speed, it's a second spine that takes pressure off the coastal Tokaido, survives storms and inspections, and keeps the country moving when the coastal can't. And the thing that actually stopped it wasn't superconductors or switches, it was a river that locals depend on. In 2025, that shifted from politics to procedure. Water management is done and the remaining work is concrete and solvable. If those last lights flip, the 9km blank under Shizuoka stops being a cautionary tale and becomes a construction sequence. 
The payoff is bigger than minutes saved. It's centre-to-centre trips that beat the plane and the world's first proof that maglev can be a backbone, not just a demo. That's what turns a futuristic idea into infrastructure you plan a life around. Solve the last two gates and Japan doesn't just launch a 500 km an hour train. It sets the precedent that decides whether maglev remains a niche experiment or becomes the template for the next generation of high-speed rail.